Uh, so welcome everyone to this impact engineered concurrent session, uh, Meet the Rising Stars. Uh, my name is Aaron Weinerman, Manager of Global Public Affairs at ASME, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. I'm based in Washington, DC, and I will be your host for this session. I'm delighted to introduce you to some incredible special guests. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to recognize a senior volunteer at ASME and a very close uh, colleague of mine, Kaylin Guiley. Kaylin serves as the Senior Vice President of Public Affairs and Outreach at ASME, uh, which includes our Engineering for Global Development uh, enterprise. So in Kaylin's day job, he serves as the Senior Manager of Global System Safety at Boeing in Washington State. So Kaylin, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you especially for your support in advancing engineering for global development at ASME. The floor is yours for some opening remarks. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you, Aaron. And uh, thank you everybody for being here. It's, it's my pleasure to uh, take a minute here to welcome you and to thank you for joining this session uh, as well as attending Impact Engineer overall. Uh, I'm just as anxious as all of you are, I'm sure, to hear from our Rising Star nominees, so I'll try to keep my remarks brief here. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, I lead the ASME Public Affairs and Outreach Sector, or uh, PANO as we call it, uh, where ASME's core constituencies, industry, government, and academia, come together to expand global awareness, knowledge, and application of engineering and technology through education, outreach, and advocacy. Uh, ASME's Engineering for Global Development, as Aaron mentioned, is one of the externally facing mission focused programs that falls within PANO. Uh, ASME, as many of you know, is also a founder and a major supporter of Engineering for Change. And it's been really inspiring to see the work that EGD and E4C have done to advance ASME's mission to advance engineering for the benefit of humanity. Uh, as you are all well aware, and as many of the speakers this morning have reinforced, we're facing a lot of really complex challenges at the moment. COVID-19 in particular has exposed humankind's collective vulnerability and has highlighted the increasing criticality of science and technology-based solutions. Uh, the pandemic's negative effect on our progress towards the SDGs, as was discussed this morning, um, and it demonstrates the disproportionate impact that uh, this pandemic is having on those around the world who lack reliable access to food, water, internet, education, and other basic needs. Uh, ASME has been around for 140 years, and in that history, we've witnessed a number of really pressing global challenges. And that history has taught us that meeting those challenges locally and systemically demands innovative and collaborative solutions. Hence the theme of this year's Impact Engineered Forum, Partnerships Advancing the Decade of Action. Uh, this is a continuation and extension of ASME's Engineering for Global Development and Engineering for Change's effort to cultivate a social entrepreneurship ecosystem and to advance innovation broadly for the benefit of humankind. Impact Engineered, along with the Engineering for Change Fellows Program, the Innovation Showcase, or iShow, uh, and Innovate for Impact, our new sustainable design challenge in partnership with Siemens, are really manifestations of this commitment to catalyze collaborations that incubate creative solutions in service of a better, safer, and more egalitarian world. I continue to be inspired by this event's impact and potential, by all the amazing work that all of you are doing and by the commitment and dedication and passion uh, that I see among all of you and I, that I know we'll see uh, in the sessions presenters today. And uh, I don't wanna delay that any longer. So thank you all for being here. Uh, back to you, Aaron. Kaylin, thanks so much. Uh, before we meet our rising stars, I should note what the Rising uh, Star Award is all about. This award is a recognition of, of great honor that features one emerging leader or organization leveraging technology to achieve social impact. Each nominee has been nominated by a prestigious sponsor. Uh, I would also remind our attendants, um, our audience, that they can use the Q&A chat function to engage with our audience, and I will ask your uh, questions and we can engage with our speakers. So let's meet our rising stars. Uh, number one, we have Stephen Long, who is representing Household Farming System. Uh, Stephen, I'll ask you uh, where you're located right now, what attracted you to engineering, and just give us a really quick overview of your technology. And Stephen, if you can hear me, you're on mute. There we yes. go. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Stephen David Long. I'm from Guyana. That's uh, in South America. We are part of the Caribbean. 
right? In Guyana, uh, the city of Georgetown is located uh, uh, on the coast, on the coastal plain. Uh, what? And also we are six feet below sea level. So there are a lot of things that affect agriculture there, right? So as an engineer, engineer in mind, uh, as our engineer do, we look for solutions. We look for ways to make life better for others. We build, we think, we construct. So in light of the challenge that, are, uh, that farmers face and the challenges that affects food supply, I uh, thought about the idea of building this device that would make agriculture not just uh, wasteful because what happens uh, also in the in Charleston that is located uh, close to the sea and we are six feet below sea level is that there's a lot of flooding and it's highly populated so uh, there's not suffi su sufficient space for a person to plant and we have to travel long distances our food has to come from the rural areas and that takes up a lot of time. So with this device, the household farming system finds simple ways to make, to bring agriculture to the urban areas. Uh, we build, we create and uh, manufacture this system. We uh, find, uh, we not just only put plants in the pots, but we find ways in which to ensure that they're sustainable. We know that they need a certain amount of sunlight, the water. So we ensure that it's also space efficient. Uh, that means persons don't have to go and uh, have a, a large portion of land to farm. So it's vertical, we make use of the vertical uh, Right now, this system is uh, carry some very um, attractive features. One of them is that it has a uh, pest, re pest uh, repellent lights, or you know these lights that repel pests. Right? Forgive me. Right? I'm not a public speaker. No, that's that's right? perfect. Thank uh, you, Stephen. Has, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to our yes. other panelists, and we'll have more of an yes. opportunity to go into each of your technologies as well. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna move to uh, Zahin Razin, uh, who's representing Hydroquo Plus. Uh, Zahin, the floor is yours to tell us where you're based right now, what attracted you to engineering, and a very quick overview of your technology. Uh, Zahin, did we lose your audio? We did. So I'm going to go now to uh, Sagun Saxena, who is representing Coco Networks. Uh, Sagun, you know the uh, the questions, and the floor is yours. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm normally based in Nairobi, in Kenya, although I'm traveling at the moment. Um, and really, what attracted me to engineering was the ability to really understand how things work. Um, and to try to find ways to, to find good solutions, better solutions uh, to the problems that exist, and then seeing those solutions get out into the world, right? And, and, and have people use them. That's, that's really what excited me was the power to impact people through, through, through good engineering. Um, so basically, you know, despite decades of, of development effort, um, most households in urban Africa still use dirty cooking fuels, right? And, and this, is, this is the problem that, that for almost a decade now has, has been a focus for me and my colleagues. And so what we've done, is basically designed an affordable, convenient, safe, new cooking solution that's based around the idea of clean fuel ATMs, right? So we create networks of these fuel ATMs, and these are relatively quick um, and inexpensive to deploy at scale, okay? And the solution that we developed um, is one that has met consumer needs in a, in a really unprecedented way. We've seen rapid growth over the last year since we launched. Um, and it does this in a way that also addresses two really important issues. One is indoor air pollution, um, and the second is climate change. Um, and so that's really the power of the solution, um, and, and that's really the, the progress that we've been making over the last few years with this technology. Excellent. Thank you very much. 
I see that Zahin is back. Uh, Zahin, do you have audio and video? <laughs> yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. The floor is yours to tell <laughs> us uh, where you're based, what attracted you to engineering originally, and a very quick overview of your technology. So, hey, everyone. Uh, Razin, Zahin Razin here, currently at Dhaka, the capital city of Bangladesh. Um, so uh, I was originally trained as a mathematician in pure mathematics, but then I realized the only way I'd be able to offer uh, value to, to, to the people around me is by levering te technology as an engine for social good. So I guess uh, engineering was the fastest way to do it. Um, so at Hydroco, we basically, uh, what we do is leverage AI through um, hydrometric information systems that um, act as a prescriptive tool for water utility sectors uh, in relation to water quality, uh, demand, um, leakage identification, the um, forecasting of demands and in prediction of events. So this is what we do as a whole. Uh, so yeah, that's us. Thanks so much. Excellent. Um, Jasmine, I'll now turn to you. Jasmine Sheen is representing ReConnect. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about your technology? Uh, what attracted you to engineering and where you're located? Hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine Cheen. I am currently located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And originally, I grew up in China and I came to the US for college. And I've always been at the intersection of science, engineering, design, and business management and urban planning. And I've seen and traveled all over the world and have learned that communities really have already embodied the innovation and strength and resourcefulness to solve a lot of the challenges that we are facing. And we are, as we can be facilitators and enablers of these communities to help them bring changes to, uh, to their own communities. And so in 2017, um, Hurricane Maria really changed the face of Puerto Rico, and that's where we started and realized that there is a major operation information and coordination gap between local communities and humanitarian aid agencies. So right now we're building ReConnect that's leveraging human networks, data, and machine intelligence to close the last mile disaster relief gaps and build long-term resilience for underserved communities. Thanks, Jasmine. I'll now turn, uh, last but not least, to Isaac Sessi, who's representing Sessi Technologies. So Isaac, uh, let us know where you are, what attracted you to engineering, and just a very quick overview of your technology. All right, thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Isaac, and I am from, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from Kumasi, Ghana, um, West Africa, which is really exciting. Um, my, so what attracted me to engineering was the fact that I realized that being able to develop solutions that people used that solve problems that they had was a very powerful thing. It could be a, a, a tool for good and a tool to solve lots of societal problems. And that was the reason why I went into engineering because um, it was at the intersection of my passion and my skills and my interest and uh, it could be a force that I could use to change the world. And that is what I'm doing now with my startup, Sessi Technologies, where we are looking to empower farmers with affordable technologies. Uh, we realize that when you look at post-harvest losses, over 30% of the food we produce um, annually is wasted. And we, we realize that most of the food produced is produced by uh, smallholder farmers who do not have the technologies needed to reduce their losses and improve their yields. So what we have done is we have developed um, a suite of technologies uh, from a low cost grain moisture meter and bundled it together with other technologies that solve post harvest losses and presented it to farmers in a way that uh, they can afford, which is um, really exciting for the African context. Thank you. Thanks, Isaac. And uh, thanks to all of our panelists for providing such interesting context about your technologies and where you can go with them. So we're going to head into a Q&A portion here. So for our audience watching, please engage with our uh, chat function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and as we kick off here, I think I'll ask everyone to comment on social entrepreneurship specifically. So we talked about, you know, what brought you to engineering, but in the realm of social entrepreneurship, what are some uh, 
uh, opportunities or challenges you're seeing in this field. I think it's probably getting a lot more attention uh, these these days than uh, compared with what Kaylin was talking about. You know, we're seeing some very stark and existential challenges as a society, a global society. So in the context of what brought you to social uh, entrepreneurship, um, I would hope that we can have a nice conversation that might let in our audience a little bit about what brought you to that space. So I'll start with uh, Sagoon, if that's okay, um, for your story. I know you're based in Singapore, right? That's also a very highly tech, uh, uh, almost Silicon Valley atmosphere. So the floor is yours. Sure. I, I think for me, um, you know, what's interesting when you look at tech, when you look at Silicon Valley tech is, is the idea that, you know, innovations can scale rapidly, right? So why can't we do that in the social impact space or the environmental space? That's, that's kind of what got me thinking about if I want to do something impactful, let me try to find a business model that can really scale, right? Because by scaling, we can reach people, we can bring more capital in. Um, and if, the model that we're creating for whatever venture we're working on is, is actually profitable, that will just accelerate the flow of capital into the venture, which will accelerate the scale and the impact, right? So, so the idea of achieving impact with the idea of running um, a business like a business uh, made a lot of sense. And so really for, for us and for, at Coco Networks, um, everything we do is with a commercial context. We are a technology company seeking to deliver an attractive return on investment to our shareholders while significantly improving the lives of the people we're serving in terms of giving them a much faster, cheaper, cleaner way to cook. Um, and in a way of doing that, that doesn't just damage the environment, right? Those two things go hand in hand. You know, we make more money for every liter of fuel that's sold, right? And we help the planet for every liter of fuel we're sold. And so there's absolutely no reason to compromise on those two things. And, and that's what social entrepreneurship means to me. So Zahin, uh, I, I guess in the same context, you know, focusing on your technology, water security for future generations, reading your, your slogan here, um, clean water is, of course, a main tenant of uh, engineering a safer and cleaner world for people. So in, in that sense, uh, what do you want to see for social entrepreneurship going forward and, and for HydroQuo Plus specifically? Yeah, to build on what Sagun said, it's basically we're, uh, I want to be able to offer uh, scalable solutions in water management um, and the water related, um, um, I would say, the fields. Um, and I guess the best way to do it is uh, kind of engaging with um, uh, um, the utility sectors in a way uh, where you'd be, be able to offer, let's say, uh, the services um, that essentially the governments are like, um, in general, uh, due to the bureaucracy, are unable to offer um, due to the lags that exist in emerging economies uh, so that we'd be able to do it. Um, and I guess like, again, social entrepreneurship is the be best way to do it. And I guess water being one of the bedrock of civilizations. And, um, you know, um, there's, there was a saying, I guess, the next world war will be fought over water. And that's why there's so many countries uh, that are trying to build aquifers so that um, when, when uh, the water stress kind of goes on out of control, they're able to kind of uh, um, extract water from there. So I guess like, um, if you're able to leverage, um, again, emerging technologies or all the scale technologies that are available, um, use it as a way to uh, provide security for uh, water um, and also kind of uh, eradicate scarcity in the process, I think it would be a great thing. And uh, I think everyone will come in a unified way. Um, and I think everyone will be impacted because again, at the end of the day, I guess if I'm not mistaken, um, 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 once every month, I guess 4 billion people are affected from water scarcity. Um, uh, so yeah, so like uh, that's uh, the idea. Um, hope that answers your question. Absolutely, thank you so much for that, uh, Jasmine. I'll now turn to you. Uh, you talked about you know in the context of natural disasters, and certainly we've all been attuned to the COVID nineteen pandemic, which is not. Uh, in the same category, but in that time, natural disasters have been popping up uh, with, with more rapidity as well. So talk to us a little bit about um, in, in that context of where uh, Reconnect started and where you'd like to see it go in, as a social entrepreneurship firm. Right, absolutely. So I went to Puerto Rico before and after Hurricane Maria and at least 4,000 people die because of the storm and its aftermath. 90% of the homes were su had suffered damages and many people endure months without water and electricity and over 100,000 people left the island of 3 million. And during my two years at MIT and I was really able to spend time on the island 
to I was volunteering rebuilding homes I was with community leaders cooking hot meals for the elderly and I was with humanitarian aid agencies distributing the different donation um, goods and services to affect a community and what really struck me was that again communities really already have they're they're so resourceful they're so optimistic and they're dedicated to to their communities when around the world that because of the growing severity and frequency of disasters that there is no entity or government will be able to meet all the needs. So there's this major push that we need to build resilience at the individual and community level. And also the humanitarian space, it's a very tricky and difficult space to be in for innovation because there is a deep and broad set of principles and directives that people have to follow because it is people's lives that are on the line. We can't just break things and, and, and experiment. And also there is limited amount of resources. Um, we can either spend money on innovation or building new things, or we can also have the money going to buying, supplying food and, and water and the basic essentials that people already need. So we have to be very, very careful how we do that. And the way that we are doing it is that we're doing it very, very closely with our community partners, with our users to elevate their voices and their expertise in, in, in the area. Because a lot of the times we put a lot more focus on the infrastructure um, rather than the more entrenched um, social um, inequalities that we're facing. So that's where we are seeing this is not just an engineering and data problem, but it's very much a people problem. And we say that there is no natural disaster ever. It's, it's, a cho it's the choices that we make as a society. That's an interesting way of framing it. I mean, certainly uh, there are a lot of um, decisions to be made and reactions that we can take as a society in the face of disasters. And but also your point about infrastructure is an important one. Um, turning now to Isaac, uh, Isaac, you know, in the context of, of your technology, what are some of the, the challenges that you faced in social entrepreneurship, but also why in the first place uh, are, are you involved in this? Uh, because you could have gone in probably many other different directions. So talk to us a little bit about um, where you'd like to see uh, SESI technologies go. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, let me start with your second question first, the why. So I personally, I, I grew up in um, in the midst of farmers. My my dad was, is a farmer, my mom is a farmer. And so agriculture was something that I grew up with. And it, it was something that hit home, close to home, because now I grew up in agriculture, which is supposed to provide the abundance of food, yet I went to bed. I, there are so many times I went to bed without eating dinner. So then um, growing up through all of these hardships and being fortunate to be able to go through uh, junior high school, senior high school, university on scholarships and on the goodwill of other people and building skills in engineering, I thought that uh, I believed that if there was one place I could give back, then that was in, that was in agriculture where I came from and being able to, you know, do my part to ensure that the kid coming after me doesn't have to go to bed on an empty stomach was something that resonated really, really well with me. And so this is my passion. It's a combination of my passion, my skill, and in the context of social entrepreneurship, it's something that can bring profit because when you're solving problems for people and you are creating value for people, value that people appreciate and are willing to pay for, um, then that is also profit. So then there's a combination of skill, passion, and then profit in social entrepreneurship. And um, in Africa, one of the biggest challenges is that you know the social entrepreneurship is, is seen with a man mindset of uh, non-profits, right? So everybody feels like, okay, well, when you say you're a social entrepreneur, give me everything for free. And it's one of the things we've had to deal with or the biggest challenges we've had to face. Because when you look at agriculture in Africa, especially given the fact that it's dominated by smallholder farmers, um, the notion or the mentality uh, that the farmers have is that, give me this for free. And so then you have the extra uh, responsibility of creating that mindset shift 
where people are now able to realize that, hey, this is a product or this is a solution that is providing me value. Once I'm getting value out of this, then um, I, I should be willing to pay for it. And so what is one of the biggest challenges we've had to overcome, the mindset shift. The second challenge we've had to overcome is the, the fact that um, now you are you fa you're faced with a lot of constraints when you're working with smallholder farmers because they are um, very, I mean, limited education, infrastructure is limited. And so you really have to think around how you can design around all of those limitations and in terms of their ability to pay. So this, these all uh, bring about challenges, but I am excited that we're, we're crossing that barrier and we hope that very soon, um, every farmer in Africa will have something that is made from tech SESI technologies or powered by SESI technologies. I like the ambition. Thanks, Isaac. And thank you for uh, letting us in on your story as well. Uh, Stephen, I'll ask you uh, the same question. I know your uh, video has been having a little bit of trouble. It might make more sense to do the audio if it cuts out, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but what attracted you to uh, no social problem. entrepreneurship specifically? And, and what are some of the impacts you're looking to make with household farming system? Floor is yours. Well, first of all, I believe in ensuring that people's lives are better now in this generation, not uh, I'm now waiting to do it for the next generation. I want to make an impact now. So the people around me, I must be able to do something to ensure that equality of lives, this standard of lives are better now in my lifetime, right? I want them to have the best health, the best food, the best lifetime to just put everything in a cup, right? We know um, in economics, we know the different um, eras. They had a time when there was uh, farming. It was solely farming. Then it went to industrial manufacturing. Then it went into services. And then what started to happen is that from services, it start, it, we entered into the information age and then we are now entering to the healthcare, the healthcare age, in which healthcare is a big, big topic. Persons want to know how to live long, right? But while going through all these different phases, something happened with our food supply, right? It has deteriorated the quality. And and the, and even though let's say the food of some in some cases where suits food supply had increased the quality right so you may take in some some stuff you eat some food some produce but then in the next couple of years you have to buy medicine to offset the effects right and that's why healthcare is having such a bang now the baby boomers have retired right Though all those persons come coming from the uh, baby boom age, they're retired and they're putting a strain on the healthcare system. And we forget to talk about healthy lifestyle. What we put in via with our food, right, uh, will determine how much strain we put on the healthcare system eventually, right? So I want to make a difference in my generation now to ensure that persons eat healthy, right? It is a challenge because there's global warming, there's flooding, there are many changes in the in the environment. So to, to give Jack his jacket, food is not growing at a fast rate, there are some challenges. There's a lot of pests, right? And in our and then because of the motive of profit, uh, uh, persons who want to cut corners and put a lot of chemicals so that they could make money to live right, to, or to, uh, to support their families, right? So uh, with this engineering, uh, this device that I've engineered, right, I'm working towards uh, is to ensure that we go back to the basics, right? To help persons uh, farm and it's not worrisome. They don't have to think about coming home from a hard day work, eight to four or two shifts, or two jobs, and then uh, uh, they have to run to the supermarket 
the thing is right there in their house, right there on their windows, in their balconies, in their verandas, right? Uh, as, as you can see here, uh, they could get a cabbage, right? And, and you're looking at uh, disposable income, right? Once this is sustained, it adds to the disposable income of the household, right? So uh, it has a health factors, right? It saves on time, right? It adds to the health of the family, the household. We have things like celery here. We know important celery is with things like coals and so. So uh, informing parts of the scientific qualities of this, uh, the science, sorry there. Informing portions of the scientific, yeah, sorry there, I, I'll end that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I think that's a good segue into, yes. I mean, we were talking a lot about the societal impact here. Uh, each of you just touched on. Uh, so, no problem. I'm just gonna. Did you hear that? Did there that? we go. Uh, so going back to uh, the, the impact here, I know that Kaylin Guiley has a question on social impact and um, Kaylin, uh, the floor is yours to ask for our panelists. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, so I, I was uh, actually just going to ask exactly what Aaron just said. You know, obviously, a big component to all of your businesses is uh, not just financial performance, but the actual impact you're having on quality of life around the world. Uh, how do you go about trying to measure your social impact? So let's start with uh, Sagun on that one. Yeah, sure. So, so measuring social impact is is a huge is a huge thing. Um, it uh, it's important for us. It's important for our investors and and other stakeholders. Uh, the way about the way we go about doing that is relatively simple in our case because we're really looking to achieve a transition from the use of a dirty fuel to the use of a clean fuel. Um, because of the way our technology works, um, we essentially have a metering system for each individual customer. So I can, I can look up in our databases and see exactly how much fuel each individual consumer has purchased, when they purchased it, et cetera. So um, with that, plus some sampling regarding the baseline, we're able to really accurately identify what kind of a transition we've achieved, right? So, and, and then of course, once we know that transition, we can assess the carbon, uh, the carbon emissions reductions, we can, uh, we can estimate the deforestation that was avoided, all those other me measures. And so that's how, the model sort of fills itself in, but the ability to measure at an individual level um, is what gives us a huge advantage in, in being able to report very, very accurate numbers. Excellent, thank you. And uh, Zahin, I'll ask the same question. Uh, obviously your technology has to do with, with measurement in a, in a different way, but um, could you also touch on how partnerships are important here? Um, because obviously uh, none of these technologies can happen in a vacuum. And so each of you has partnerships that inform your, your progress and how you measure it. So uh, the floor is yours. Right, um, thank you again, Aaron. Um, so I, I basically, I knew the best way to uh, commercialize the technology and I, I think made this uh, viable product uh, for Bangladesh, a country that um, hasn't even been able to, I guess, like optimize on their e-commerce uh, industries by kind of working with the government hands on. So when I went to the government and I said, hey, uh, you have a lot of water quality issues and, uh, you know, and, um, the one of the leading causes of water quality issues is due to the decaying pipelines and aging infrastructure. So irrespective of you building new pipelines, the water is always going contami to get contaminated. So why don't I just, you know, deploy a hydrometric device that will act as a decision support system for you to act um, on, um, I can I, I take data driven decision um, based on our uh, region specific areas. And so um, they, they kind of agreed to it and I got lucky. And then, um, you know, I went on about uh, deploying a device at an area that was able to offer, um, I guess the data on based on 100,000 house connections. So at a time we were able to kind of map out uh, where the sources of um, turbidity uh, spikes were coming from or the hotspots areas where let's say the um, um, E. coli content was coming from um, the total fecal coli from the essential uh, water uh, quality index parameters according to the World Health Organization. So by that we were able to, by definition, working with the on-field engineers and with our um, technology, we were able to get ahead of things and also reduce the OPEX and also kind of increase non-revenue water profits of the water utility sector. And then 
uh, to give you also like a shorter example is uh, we're using radiometric imaging using computational hydraulics. Um, so the satellite data, we kind of ingest that um, with the ground data as well as um, the satellite data. And then we are able to kind of map out where again, the sources of anomalies are coming from. So let's say for instance, someone might say that um, this is where uh, on my, while my house connection is um, possibly going from a, a water leakage and I'm not getting water supply. So essentially the area would have been, in, um, according to assumptions, would be in a different location. We are able to uh, like specifically point out where the sources of leakage is coming from. So by that, we are kind of also reducing inefficiencies. So I think um, the impact is again, built on the utility sector as, and as uh, the value that we provide through that, uh, the decision system. So yeah. Excellent, thank you, very informative. Um, Jasmine, I'll turn to you. I know you work with a lot of partners and uh, have they been instrumental or what, what's been the process in helping you get that measurement of your impact? Um, is that something you can do in-house or is that something you lean more on for with, with your partnerships? Yeah, absolutely. Um, measuring impact in the disaster space is very complicated. And so we essentially work to bring positive change to enhance disaster resilience, meaning the capacity to withstand and recover from shocks. So both at individual community and disaster management levels. And so our goal is to reduce adverse effect from disaster and improve services for individuals and grow capacity with effective organizing and access to resources at the community level and to improve efficacy with better informed decisions and enhanced coordination at the agency and, and management system level. And because of the complexity, we cannot only be tracking our impact when a disaster happens. So in the, in the disaster humanitarian aid world, we look at both the blue sky time, meaning the recovery and preparation mitigation time, and also the gray sky time, meaning the response time, and which we all have to be in, in compliance with humanitarian aid principles and standards. And in regards to our partners, because a huge component of what we do is to help them measure their impact. So a lot of this, it is indeed in collaboration to look at what kind of metrics make sense for them and how do we leverage and also look at our internal system. So to give some examples of, of the blue sky measures that we would look at is, um, so for example, a huge component is that we are mobilizing community members to be part of um, community level disaster relief work. So we do measure engagement level and how much information is crowdsourced and the level of increasing social capital and connectedness as that as, as a proxy to measure um, increasing resilience during blue sky time. And during gray sky, sky time, say when a disaster do happen, we use a combination of software techno te te analytics and, and also dedicated surveys and, and also partner data sources to track um, um, if any of the task is completed, if there's a response re re reduction in the response time, and if there's reduction in physical and mental health threats. And a lot of this, we are very carefully designing as part of our engagement and governance structure um, in our code development process and piloting and si uh, simulation. And because Again, as I said before, humanitarian aid work is uh, very sensitive and we definitely want to do it right and not to risk lives. Thank you. Isaac, for SESI Technologies, uh, how do you measure your impact and, and why is that measurement important in, in your sector? You know, how does that inform a more technical and uh, we've, we've been talking about the commercial imperative and a lot of this. So can you talk to us a little bit about um, what, what you do to measure and, and why? All right, thank you, Aaron. Um, so when, you're, when we are looking about at impact, we're looking at it from multiple angles. We are looking at it from what impacts are we making in the lives of the farmers that we're working with? What is important to them? And when you look at the farmers, the number one thing that is important to them is more money in their pockets. Now, more money in their pockets means that they can um, pay school fees, they can pay hospital bills and their general standard of living is improved. So for every, any group of smallholder farmers we are working with, uh, we're taking baseline data, we are bringing in our interventions, and then after the season is over, we're looking at what, what has been improvements in the metrics that are important to them and to us. So to them, 
what what how much extra income did they make and with extra income it translates into a better quality of life for them now for us we are looking at how much um how much of grains were we able to save how much of food waste were we able to to reduce because when you look at it at a higher level from a food security perspective um you realize that 821 million people are going hungry every every day and um we're losing a third of the food we're producing, which 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 is more than enough to feed all of these 821 million people four times over. So being able to reduce these losses, um, we're able to quantify how much losses we're able to reduce. And, and that lets us know, even from a high level, how many less people are going to, to bed um, hungry. Now, when you look at it from even the perspective of climate, uh, we know that if food waste was was a country, it would be the third largest um, emitter of greenhouse gases. So we're counting how much, how many kilograms of waste we are reducing and estimating what's the benefit even to the, the um, to what's the benefit even to climate change. So um, we're tracking a variety of metrics uh, and looking at what is, what is important for the smallholder farmer, what's important for the economy, um, the local economy, and what is important for, say, uh, global food security. And we are looking at how we're, our work is contributing to improvement in all of, all of these metrics. Thanks, Isaac. You, you just mentioned security, and I think an, a nice counterpoint to that is sustainability, which is a major component of impact engineered, engineering for change, and uh, all of your technologies. So we, we only have a few minutes left, but I'd just like to ask each of you in a, in a word or two what you're doing specifically to make sure that your technology is sustainable and so that when you're going into different areas that they're able to then harness this technology and be able to use it um, themselves instead of you know having to go back all the time to get that expertise. So I'll start with Sagun. Um, can you have a word or two about how you're focused on sustainability? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think the key key thing there is to really um, work through local partners. So, for example, um, you know, for the cooking solution that we provide, um, it's really supplied to our customer base through local shopkeepers, right? So again, I mentioned in Kenya we have six hundred shopkeepers in Nairobi who are all our partners who sell the stoves that we sell. They sell the fuel through these ATM machines, um, and we're really equipping them to be the point of service and support to customers. So that once uh, our solution is introduced into the market, they can ensure that it continues to deliver for um, you know for the customers, and, and so that's a really important part of it because this is a, this is an essential solution for people a stove that they use every day to safely cook their food, um, even a day or two without it um, is right. it causes real harm, and so it's important that that we have good service and support. Thank you. Uh, Zahin, I'm, I'm sure in, in your realm, in terms of water security, this is a, a major uh, influence. So just a couple words, how sustainability applies for HydroQuo Plus. So ultimately, the I think the total value lies in the aggregate data that we store rather than the hardware that's being used to store the data. So I mean, like uh, to kind of um, extract the data. So I guess sustainability comes from being able to see uh, the past and then being able to act on the past uh, for future decisions um, uh, using the existing data that you have, I guess, um, I guess, and then um, that would act as a way of a uh, mode of, uh, of sustainability of some sort uh, to answer your question. Thank you. Sure. Isaac, you talked about uh, farmers wanting more money in their pockets and, you know, because uh, sustainability is a way that makes that process one that can last. Uh, how are you thinking about it in the context of SESI technologies? Um, so in, in sustainability, we're looking at um, how do we ensure that we're building a system that uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be everywhere. And just to uh, build on what Sagun said, we're also working with local partners in, in different countries to to make sure that uh, the solutions are made available to them. We're working with other bigger partners like the World Food Program, um, other multinational um, companies that play a very key role in, in, in the lives of, of these smallholder farmers. And basically are working, working with partners to ensure that um, they have access to, to these solutions in a, in, a, in a way that is sustainable to them. 
Thank you. And Jasmine, I think in the natural disaster context, you know, a major criticism is usually uh, groups go in and they have a response and then there's a lack of follow up or the response is, is not sustainable. So can you talk a little bit about um, your, your role in, in this context? Yeah, absolutely. The core inspiration for what we're doing is what we see what's happening in communities and exactly because governments and external partners go in and and not without understanding what's going on on the ground and that's really causing the issue so we're really flipping that whole dynamic and trying to help elevate communities voices trying to make their stories and and what they see and what they experience count and so and we do so everyone on the team is very well versed in practice in human and humanity centered design and we care about social justice everyone as a team and we work very 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 closely from the very start of the first conversation with our community and humanitarian aid agency um, everything that they are part of both the design and the governance of our solution and we see the the and we understand from everywhere around the world that the social connectedness and the the self-sustaining process of uh, of community engagement is really both the core of disaster resilience and the core of um, our work. Thank you. Stephen, uh, same question about sustainability. Uh, how is that informing how you would like to change the agricultural realm? That's to me, right? My feed your frost just now. Stephen? Yes, please. If you can hear okay, us good. about sustainability. Yes, sustainability, first of all, um, pricing is important. We want to ensure that the price is one that the average person uh, can afford so uh, they can sustain it. Secondly, we are going to be set up a very strong service arm so that persons who need to uh, uh, replenish plants and do repairs and so and uh, regular checkups, ensure that persons are, uh, they are, are motivated to sustain their systems. Uh, we also work along with NGOs and, and the government and other organizations to give support to communities uh, holistically. And, 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 and that is uh, how we plan to uh, ensure that this project is sustainable. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so we're wrapping up here and I would like to note that everyone can check out more about our panelists and their technologies. Uh, their videos were made available earlier and now is time to vote. So you can, uh, you can go into the link which has been put into the chat by ASME staff and be sure to vote for your favorite choice. The winner will be announced tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And this will be during the Impact Engineered Award Ceremony. You can also visit the uh, Rising Stars virtual booth, which is in our exhibit hall, and you can learn more and connect with Stephen, Zahin, Sagun, Jasmine, and Isaac. Um, and I would really like to express uh, my gratitude and ASME's gratitude. And I guess with one minute left, I would ask uh, Sagun, uh, I see you. Uh, are you. What drew you to ASME? How did you hear about us? Because uh, this is something we'd certainly like to keep going and expand. Um, no, we, so we've been aware of different programs um, that have been going on, particularly in Kenya. And so, so for us, it's a network of, you know, just connecting with experts and, and identifying talent that we can work with. And so definitely really appreciative of, of the efforts that the SME is, is doing. Well, thank you. I don't think I would be effective ASME employee if I didn't put in an ASME plug. But I do want to say that we look forward to working with all of you in the future. Um, we've all talked about these partnerships being an important means of continuing these goals. So uh, we'd love to be in touch. And thank you for joining us. Thank you to our audience members and enjoy the rest of your impact engineered experience. Thanks, everyone.